Welcome back to Global Agenda at the University of Delaware. I'm Ralph Begleiter, Director of the Center for Political Communication. Global Agenda is supported by the University of Delaware's Institute for Global Studies, by the Department of Political Science and International Relations, and the Department of Communication. Yesterday, the stock market plunged 150 points after the world-famous news agency Associated Press announced on its official Twitter feed that explosions at the White House had injured President Obama. It was false. The AP's Twitter account had been hacked by someone who later claimed to be responsible for it as the Syrian Electronic Army. In the United Arab Emirates, when you attempt to reach some widely popular websites, an official-looking message appears on your screen denying you access and announcing that the site you're trying to reach contains untrusted content. The announcement cites government regulations of internet content. In China for a few years, it was possible to use the Google search engine to find things on the internet. But people who typed in the same search request in China and elsewhere got different results. Google was self-censoring to comply with the Chinese government demands to limit political content and some other things. And it still seems strange to me, admittedly a stodgy old traditional journalist, that people would trust anything they see from sources with names like Twitter, Google, Tumblr, Instagram, and the best one of all, Yahoo! Our speaker tonight lives and breathes issues like these and many more. And she comes at it with a highly respected background as a journalist with years working in Asia, where the internet is still evolving as a source of useful and uninhibited information. Rebecca McKinnon is senior fellow at the New America Foundation in Washington, working on global internet policy, free expression, and the impact of digital technologies on human rights. She is co-founder of Global Voices, an international citizen media network. She's a former news correspondent in Asia, where she worked in Beijing for nine years, including several as CNN's bureau chief, and then as CNN's Tokyo bureau chief for three years. She started her work on the internet at Harvard's Berkman Center for Internet and Society, where she launched Global Voices. Rebecca taught journalism at the University of Hong Kong, and she has conducted research and writing as an Open Society Fellow. She has also been a visiting fellow at Princeton's Center for Information Technology Policy. Rebecca McKinnon earned her AB magna cum laude at Harvard and was a Fulbright Scholar in Taiwan in 1991 and 92. Please welcome Rebecca McKinnon to the University of Delaware. Thanks so much, Ralph. It's great seeing you after all these years. <laughs> uh, both moved on to new and different post-CNN lives. And thank you very much to the University of Delaware for hosting me and for all of you uh, who chose to, came today, chose to come today. Um, we spent the afternoon with students talking about a whole range of issues. And I kind of realized that you know, there are so many different possible subjects that we could talk about. But I'm going to concentrate tonight on some issues um, that I dealt with in my recent book. Oops, I'm sorry. It already advanced. Here we are. Uh, which came out last year, um, a little over a year ago, which really examines the relationship between the global internet, human rights, and the future of democracy around the world. And my argument is based on what I believe is the reality for an increasing percentage of people around the world. The relationship between citizens and governments is increasingly mediated through the internet and through mobile devices that are in turn connected to the internet. So we're dependent upon the internet and network to technologies for our jobs, for our personal lives, but increasingly for our politics, for our information about what's happening in the world, for our ability to organize, um, to bring change to uh, things that we want change. But the, the challenge is, and in the book I argue, 
that we can't assume just because the internet exists that the internet is going to operate in a manner that most benefits the citizen, the individual. And it will only benefit the citizen and the, and the individual. The internet will only be compatible with human rights and democracy if we work to make it so. Just as in our physical environment, uh, our communities will not be uh, governed in a way that respect our rights and interests unless we are involved in the governance and in the shaping of these communities. And it's no less true for the internet um, than it is in our physical world. Uh, but it's a complicated situation. And one of the things that I called for in the book, which I finished in August of 2011, and then it went off to the printer, and you know, it's an old school printed book, so it takes a few months to actually come, come out. And just a couple weeks before my book actually hit bookstores and was actually going to be shipped by Amazon, what happened? WikiLeaks went dark for an entire day in protest. It was very interesting because one of the things that I was calling for in my book was that if we want the internet to remain open and free and compatible with our rights, we need a movement to fight for it. And here a movement was becoming much more evident. Now why did WikiLeaks go dark on January 18th of last year? It was in protest over a bill uh, in the House of Representatives known as SOPA, the Stop Online Piracy Act, and it had a sister bill in the Senate, the Protect IP Act, uh, which, which had been put together, you know, not, to, not with the intention of repressing citizens or censoring speech, but to protect copyright, which is something that actually a lot of constituencies in their country want government to do a better job of doing on the internet. Um, but the problem was is that the law hadn't thought through how do you do this in a way that doesn't end up infringing on other rights? And the, the law, the way it was written, was going to place responsibility on internet companies for the speech of the users and hold them kind of responsible in advance for whether or not the users violated copyright. And the result of this was going to be that in order to prevent um, getting in legal trouble themselves, the companies were going to have to proactively monitor and censor content that might get them in trouble before they actually knew that because they were going to be held uh, responsible to that degree. Uh, and so there was concern that this was going to result in content being censored that was actually had a legal right to exist under the co Constitution uh, and that the power would be abused and that there were not sufficient checks and balances that would prevent this requirement on companies to monitor and censor content, which was only supposed to be targeted at uh, copyright violations, but there was concern that it would be overinterpreted and abused, and there weren't enough checks against preventing it from being abused. Um, another point that was made was that technically, the mechanisms that uh, companies were going to have to deploy in order to be in compliance with the law were the, technically the very same things and also legally the same types of mechanisms that are used to censor the internet in countries like China, um, which created a great deal of concern around the world that by passing this law, the US was going to help to legitimize censorship mechanisms around the world that are constantly abused for, against political speech. And so there, a, a huge movement emerged. There's this uh, group called Fight for the Future that raised money on the internet to put up billboards outside of Congress people's offices uh, who had sponsored the bill. Um, companies kind of rallied, also internet companies rallied in opposition to the bill. And a bill that, which just several months before in Washington people had assumed was gonna pass, ended up getting killed because of this movement. And this was an example of the kind of power of people to kind of change uh, the way that basically express concerns that efforts to regulate the internet for well-intentioned reasons had to be better thought, thought through in order to prevent abuse. In Europe around the same time, there were protests against a 
trade agreement that the United States was actually pushing forward with his trade partners called the Anti-Counterfeiting Trade Agreement um, that had similar measures in it to SOPA. Uh, and actually, um, all of the European Union countries had actually signed on to this, but it hadn't yet been ratified by most parliaments, and a huge groundswell of popular opposition arose, and this is one protest in Poland that took place, and the European Parliament ended up rejecting the whole thing. Uh, and, and a range of national par parliaments also ended up rejecting the treaty because of the groundswell of public op opposition, prior to which nobody had really been paying any attention at all to this legislation. And this is, an again, an example of citizens recognizing that you can't just expect everything's going to work out unless you're paying attention to the details of the laws that are being proposed to regulate the Internet and make sure that not only do they accomplish whatever it is that they're meant to accomplish, but they do not create mechanisms that could actually um, stifle speech or limit speech in different ways. And this movement has not been limited to North America and Western Europe, but actually this is an anti-censorship protest in India. Um, there is a, a big movement that's growing in India around some laws that were passed that make it easy for the government to demand content to be re removed from social media sites if some politician thinks they've been defamed, uh, which has resulted in the censorship of political criticism uh, and people trying to get that changed. And also, this movement has also spread internationally to international organizations and the United Nations. This is uh, a activist group called Access, and this is their website. And they were one of many activist groups and human rights groups that were rallying last year to prevent a United Nations organization known as the International Telecommunications Union from basically expanding their power to regulate international telephone system to include regulation of the internet. And Russia and China had been lobbying very heavily for this to happen because, of course, they wanted their national governments to have more say in the global system of regulating the internet. Human rights groups pushed back against this, um, got the US government on board. A lot of Western companies were also very much opposed to it. This is the International Telecommunications Union in Action, a, uh, a meeting there. Um, and with internet governance, this is another meeting, and I know they look very similar, but the first picture was a picture of government officials representing national interests for how they think the internet should be run. This is another organization known as the Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers, which is a nonprofit organization where engineers and a range of companies, a range of civil society groups, and governments come together and negotiate what the standards and protocols should be for managing the uh, domain name system around the world. And this is sort of just to kind of visualize the domain name system. But the fact that you can go to a website, let's say CNN.com, and get the same site from Delaware and from New York or from New Delhi is not just some freak of nature or, or kind of magical thing. It actually requires a great deal of technical coordination so that networks around the world are actually taking you to the same website when you type in the same address. It's, it's actually quite complicated. And there's a whole governance system around that and around who gets to control domain names, who gets to create domain names, uh, and, and a whole kind of uh, regulatory, non-governmental private regulatory system around that. And that's one of the functions that the United Nations was talking about moving, at least in part, to be controlled by the United Nations instead of basically what we call a multi-stakeholder organization where you have various internet experts, engineers, companies, civil society groups really negotiating what's in the best public interest as opposed to governments, um, uh, you know, basically kind of voting, you know, whatever the majority of the most powerful governments want to do gets to happen. And, and of course, this is a site that was put together by Google 
to try and get people to petition around the world. And so it was a very interesting kind of uh, alliance of certain companies and human rights activists, free speech activists, and certain democratic governments kind of pushing back against efforts by the United Nations to governmentize basically a relatively privately run um, internet governance system that we have today. And what this really speaks to is the way in which the internet is challenging the classic concept of national sovereignty uh, and the concept of governance with the nation state as the organizing principle and the nation state being the organizing principle through which power is both wielded and held accountable. And of course, that's been changing slowly over a number of decades with many multinational corporations exercising increasing power over many populations. And there are a lot of large corporations whose net worth is much, uh, much greater than some countries' uh, GDP. Um, but in my book, I talk about the sovereigns of cyberspace. Um, and we have here you know, Mark Zuckerberg, Steve Jobs, um, the Google kids, Jeff Bezos of Amazon. Uh, and the uh, and, and Bill Gates, of course. And the point I, I make, the argument I make in the book, is that while, of course, nation states still have power over our physical being and our physical communities, increasingly the choices that are being made, the engineering decisions, the programming decisions, uh, the decisions about what you can and cannot do on Facebook or what you can and cannot do uh, on your Amazon web hosting service, or what you can and cannot do with your Apple devices, is increasingly affecting your physical freedoms in different ways, your, your physical ability to speak, to organize, whether or not your privacy is respected on Facebook may have real life implications for your freedom or lack thereof uh, in real life, or what you can and cannot do on Twitter might affect, again, a political outcome. Uh, we've seen actually sort of interesting codependencies where, you know, uh, I think we've, we've just had a presidential election where social media was a very important factor and uh, one of many important factors in the outcomes. And so I like to show this map, which is the world map of social networks. And I think it just opposes very interestingly um, on the map of, of national sovereignties. And what you have here, and this is the, the latest one that was published, this is published um, twice a year by a, an Italian internet company um, or internet consultant. And what he does is he, he, he works out um, through a kind of system of what's known as Alexa rankings, which rates kind of the, the, the usage of different sites, which social network is most popular in which countries. So you see all that blue? Those are all the countries where Facebook is the most popular social network. And as you may have heard, if Facebook were a country, it would be the, the world's third largest after China and India in, in terms of population. Uh, the countries that are not blue, very interestingly, Iran, which blocks Facebook, China, which also blocks Facebook, and Russia, which doesn't block Facebook, but for various interesting reasons, has, has still been able to maintain dominance of Russian companies in the social networking space. Um, and so you have some countries, which are not democracies, really pushing back at the growth of Facebook and the popularity of Facebook and seeing it as a threat to their national sovereignty, which is why when you try to visit Facebook in China and you're using a Chrome browser, it looks slightly different depending on what kind of browser you use, but you try and, and, and uh, visit Facebook in China, this is what the Great Firewall of China looks like from the inside. You get an error message, this page cannot be found. And in China, there are a lot of pages that cannot be found, and that is what people like to call the Great Firewall of China in action, blocking Facebook and Twitter and all the big social media sites, but 
also a whole range of Chinese language sites operating outside of China that have content that the Chinese government objects to. But that blocking system is, is really only the first layer of censorship in China. Um, the second layer is something, I know this is a Chinese language page, but this picture of the ceremony is, is interesting. This is a ceremony conducted in 2009 and it's called the Internet Self-Discipline Awards. And it's offered, it's, it's given to the top companies in China every year that do the best job of policing their websites in terms of removing content in accordance with the government's requirements and in monitoring users and informing the authorities in appropriately rapid fashion about troublemakers on their sites. Uh, and I actually got into this ceremony in 2009, and one of the recipients um, you might be interesting to, interested to know was a gentleman named Robin Lee, who's the CEO of a search engine called Baidu, which is China's largest search engine. Uh, and it re, it's listed on the stock market here in the United States and gets a lot of American investors' um, investment. In fact, there are Americans on its board. Um, but... Uh, that's how it works. Um, and this is sort of an example of some of the censorship in action. This is one of their social media platforms. I, I did some experiments on Chinese social media sites trying to post sensitive content. This is an article about uh, a Nobel Peace Prize winner who has been put in jail for 10 years. And I couldn't even publish the article. So it's not just about blocking the content. It's about keeping it off the internet entirely. And this kind of self-discipline and this mechanism was actually the same mechanism that U.S. companies would have had to deploy if they had to abide by SOPA and keep any potential infringing copyrighted content off of their sites in order to avoid either fines or prosecution. Um, and this is one of the reasons why Many people in this country objected to that law, even though its intent was not political censorship, but it was going to put in place mechanisms that are just too easily abused or misused um, or that could overcompensate in ways that would chill political speech. And so the roles of companies and the decisions they make, whether or not to abide by these types of systems or not to play ball, as, as Google sort of ended up moving out of China because they didn't want to comply with this kind of system anymore. Um, the decisions that companies make is, is critical to our physical freedoms. And the question is, how do we hold them more accountable? Much has been made of the role of social media in the Arab Spring. We have Tunisia here. We have Egypt over there. Uh, and certainly social media played a part in the downfall of two dictators, although there are many other parts of the Middle East which, uh, where dictators uh, remain very much um, in action. But what is less known, um, and the story I want to tell you, is about the surveillance that continues in countries like Egypt, you know, despite the fact that Mubarak um, step down. And we know about this in part thanks to something that happened in March 2011, uh, a couple months after the regime fell. It was very interesting. I was trying to get my book written in the middle of all this change and kind of rewriting my book constantly. And on a Saturday afternoon, I happened to turn on Twitter and I happened to follow on Twitter a number of Egyptian activists who had obviously been posting a lot of interesting things at that time. And I noticed that a bunch of people were posting to Twitter about, oh, we just got into the Egyptian state security headquarters. And I just got into the room where I was interrogated last year, and so on. And people were, this, this photo on the left, with all these shredded pieces of, pieces of paper, was taken by an activist who got into the state security headquarters and there were all these shredded documents that the agents tried to destroy before the activists got in. But there were, of course, many archive rooms that, that had intact files. And interestingly, what people found there, some people found their own files, they found files of people they knew. 
what was in there. It was reams of reams of email transcripts, cell phone text messages, Skype conversations that they thought had been secure, things they uploaded and downloaded from the web that had been captured by their internet service provider and the censorship system that was on their internet service provider. And one activist actually found a contract um, for something called deep packet inspection, inspections technology, which enables the network provider to basically capture granular information by users in a much more detailed and targeted way. And uh, this, this contract had come from a British company called Gamma, um, which is actually currently being sued by Privacy International for the same technology uh, that they have sold in Bahrain and, and elsewhere and suing the British government for uh, not preventing its sale to governments that were known to commit human rights abuses. Um, and while actually that particular sale, the Gamma technology sale, did not go through before the regime fell, we're not quite sure what went through afterwards, but we also know that another technology by another company, an American company called Naris, owned by Boeing, um, had been purchased by the Egyptian government some years previously. Uh, and it's very similar to a technology used by the NSA on some of our networks, which I'll talk about a little more later, but that, that technology is being sold around the world to um, governments with even less checks and balances, much fewer checks and balances or accountability than we have. Um, so what's really interesting about this is, you know, for those of us who are old enough to remember the fall of the Berlin Wall, uh, there's a few of us here, um, the, in, in Berlin, after the Berlin Wall fell, people were able to get in the Stasi offices. And this is a, a picture from East Berlin in January 1990, when some protesters got into the secret police offices and started rifling through files. Later on, the uh, unified government decided that the secret police files should be allowed to be open to any citizen that wanted to see their Stasi files um, from previous times. And some people elected to take a look at them and found that you know, neighbors, uh, sometimes relatives, sometimes spouses, sometimes children had been spying on them. And after a while, and a lot of people decided they didn't really want to know. Uh, and uh, it was a very traumatic thing in East German um, society, when German society generally. Uh, and of course, the uh, concerns about surveillance in Europe today uh, are very much grounded in these experiences that, that people had both during the Cold War and, and earlier. Um, but people in Europe, are also increasingly concerned, and there's increasing media coverage um, about another problem, about how these technologies are deployed and marketed by companies based in democratic societies and are being used to facilitate repression in lots of different places. And so this is an investigative journalism website called Utdragranskning, based in Sweden. Um, and they did an investigative report last year in which they uncovered that the, the major Swedish Finnish telecommunications company called Teleasonera had been assisting with the surveillance of political dissidents from Azerbaijan to Belarus uh, and a number of other former Soviet republics. Um, and uh, this created a huge scandal in the Swedish media. Um, and Telia Sonera initially responded by, this is what we have to do. We're a business. We have to follow the law of the country we're in. Give us a break, leave us alone. Um, the public didn't respond well to that, and shareholders actually, uh, to the Swedish shareholders' credit, didn't respond so well to that either. And Telia Sonera actually, under pressure from shareholders and from the media and, and in part from some sectors of, of parliament, ended up contracting a Danish human rights organization to conduct a human rights assessment of their entire company and to give them recommendations for 
how they can mitigate surveillance problems in their networks around the world. This is still ongoing. We still don't know kind of what's going to come out of it. They also committed to have a dialogue or to lead a dialogue with a number of other European telecommunications companies about what their human rights responsibilities ought to be. And again, the outcome of that dialogue is yet to be seen what concrete measures these companies will take uh, as they're trying to generate profits around the world, also yet to be seen, but a very interesting development nonetheless. And the point really is, is this, that, you know, I, I think there's kind of a, a naive and I would argue dangerous assumption that permeates a lot of media narratives and kind of political discourse and also sort of activist assumptions. That is that, you know, you have to oversimplify slightly, but for purposes of illustration, you have authoritarian countries there, you have democratic countries there, and thanks to the internet and new technologies, it's just inevitable and inexorable that these guys are gonna sort of evolve over there. And it's just, it's just you know, determined by the nature of technology that that's gonna happen. Um, there's a big assumption that is made, I think, uh, throughout our policy circles, media, and so on, and I would argue that we cannot assume that. Depending on the quality of laws, the quality of the nature of corporate decisions, the extent to which the internet is being governed, engineered, and legislated, and how, what kind of choices are being made, if the wrong choices, if too many wrong choices get made in too many places by too many governments and companies, What's going to happen, I warn, is that we might meet in the middle. China will become a little more free because people are talking about more stuff on the internet, but it's not going to democratize necessarily. You can, you can have a big conversation on the Chinese version of Twitter called Weibo about local abuses or train crashes or pollution problems, but try using Weibo to organize an opposition party not going to happen. Similarly, there's a concern, a growing concern, uh, among a new political generation in North America and in Europe, that if we're not careful, we're going to meet them in the middle, unless we work to ensure that that doesn't happen. One of the members of this new political generation uh, coming back to East Germany, since I've been on this East German kick a little bit, is this guy named Malte Spitz, who's a Green Party politician. And he did an experiment just to kind of illustrate his concern, which he, he was able to, um, under German privacy and data protection law, to contact his cell phone service provider, and he was ab able to obtain the records from his service provider of everywhere he had been in the past six months, absolutely everywhere. And then he teamed up with a German newspaper and they created this huge inf infographic. And based on the records from his cell phone provider, you could trace absolutely everywhere he had been in that six month period. And even if you didn't have, you know, incontroversial, even if that phone was not registered to his name, all you needed to do is have enough information about that person is where he's been to triangulate the rest. Uh, and he did this to emphasize the fact that in the past, in the, in the old society in East Berlin, it was the, the state had to mobilize neighbors and loved ones and cousins and you know, teachers and students to spy on each other in order to obtain records. Now our technology is just generating this stuff everywhere. And so the issue is, how do you prevent that? There's the, part of the issue is to what extent, you know, why are we collecting so much information and retaining it and who, who should be required to retain it, but also the use of that information, the access to that information, and how do you prevent abuse? Because we want the convenience of the technology but how do you prevent abuse um, of the surveillance power that, that's baked in? 
And of course, in this country, there's ongoing controversy um, about, if I can get this to work, warrantless surveillance. Um, this is a facility at Folsom Street in San Francisco, AT&T facility, exchange point that, that um, basically handles a great deal of traffic in and out of this country and, um, and the rest of the world. Um, a lot of communications, mainly by American citizens who are not uh, suspected of any crime uh, and are not under investigation. Uh, but nonetheless, in 2003, the NSA set up a secret room that only class people with security clearances could enter at that facility and siphoned off all the traffic going through that facility uh, and stored it somewhere uh, for, later, for, for later use and analysis. And there have been a number of lawsuits um, in an attempt to get this declared unconstitutional. There have been efforts to sue the companies, because this isn't just AT&T, although we have the most proof about AT&T, to sue companies for collaborating in illegal surveillance by the government. But then the law got amended to give companies immunity from collaborating with anything that might be determined to be illegal later on. Um, and uh, there was a, a Supreme Court decision recently that said the the plaintiffs claiming that they would been, had been target of this uh, surveillance, which a number of civil liberties groups, um, both on the right and the left, argue is unconstitutional. Um, the Supreme Court said that the, the plaintiffs in this case couldn't prove that harm had been done to them, so therefore the case was thrown out. There's still another suit in, in the courts that's, again, trying to get at the constitutionality of this, and it relates to the Patriot Act and the expansion of surveillance powers. But ultimately, it comes down to how do we make sure that this power is held accountable, that we even know what's going on, that we can even know whether the power has been abused, or if it's so obscure, if you can't know who's abusing the power, or if harm has been done, how can you hold an abuser accountable? And then what does that do to our democracy down the road? And so this, this is the concern. It's, it's not that we should not have intelligence and we should not have law enforcement, but how do you prevent power from being abused? You have to at least know what's happening <laughs> on some level. There has to be some kind of meaningful oversight, and there's concern that we're losing that. There's also an effort to reform outdated laws that um, have resulted in the Fourth Amendment protections that... Uh, make it impossible for the police to look at your mail sent in the postal mail w without a warrant uh, or search your home. Your email has much weaker protections. Um, and in fact, if your email is stored on Gmail or Yahoo Mail or something and it's over 180 days old, the law, which was written in the 1980s, back when the web didn't really exist, actually considers that email to be abandoned and therefore it can just be requested. Uh, and uh, this, again, there's an effort to reform that law and a bit of a political battle going on in Washington over those who say, well, law enforcement needs this access. But then why don't we give them access to our paper? You know, what about the Fourth, fourth Amendment? Again, how do we make sure there's sufficient due process, sufficient constraint against abuse? Um, Another battle that's raging, and we were talking with the students about this a little bit um, before dinner, is something called the Cyber Intelligence Sharing and Protection Act, um, which just passed the House of Representatives. And this is a bill that's, in, again, in response, like SOPA, in response to what many would argue is a legitimate problem. U.S. networks, computer networks, are under attack. You know, there's every week there's some report about a big hacking attack against an organization, um, a, about intellectual property being stolen. You know, quite a lot of the attacks seem to be coming from China. More needs to be done to secure our networks. It's true, more needs to be done to secure our networks. But there's a debate about how. And this act, this bill, um, proposes that it be made much easier for companies to share 
information about sort of threats to their network with the government and with government agencies generally, which in theory sounds sensible. The problem is there's no restrictions on you know, the type of information. It, it can include personally identifying information. It can include your email exchanges. And there's insufficient constraint to protect, to prevent that information after being shared ostensibly for cybersecurity purposes to be used for some other investigation by some other agency. There's completely insufficient protections. And so civil liberties groups are arguing that this is completely decimates whatever privacy law we actually have. Um, and so that passed in the House. The administration actually threatened to veto it. We'll see what's going on. But what this really comes down to, um, and I, I apologize if the next slide isn't very clear. It had, it's one of those slides that was clear in another context and is probably less clear here. Um, but uh, what it really comes down to is, again, understanding what's going on so that we can either give or withdraw our consent based on an accurate knowledge of who is exercising power over what, over whom, what the consequences are, and whether we agree with that. And if we think power is being abused, that there's some ability to ex exert consequences on the abusers or to change the law. And of course, if everything's so opaque, if you don't know what the government's asking of companies, if you don't know what the, go the companies are giving to the government, if there's no, no oversight or no meaningful oversight, what does that ultimately mean for a democratic society? And if we're not exercising oversight, you can imagine what's going on elsewhere. Um, and so one of the efforts that's been going on uh, in part sort of with encouragement of um, activists and academics and others who are concerned about this problem, is that some companies, with Google actually taking the lead on this, and I'm not saying that Google is perfect. There are a number of things I'm mad at them about, but this is actually one thing that they're doing a very good job on, um, which is they're now twice a year, and I think they're going to be releasing a new iteration tomorrow or the next day, um, they are issuing twice a year what they call a transparency report. And it's hard to see this, but there's a bar graph there. And you can click through country by country. And they're giving data about the number of government requests they're receiving for user information, country by country. And also, what percentage of requests they actually complied with, which means what percentage of requests they refused. And, they, they ref and in every single country, of course, there's some countries where they didn't comply with any requests. And then there are other countries where they comply with a substantial number. But even in this country, they're not complying with all the requests. Under what circumstances do they refuse to comply with a request? When they determine it's not legal according to the law of that very country. Um, so in other words, there's a certain percentage of requests that Google is getting from governments around the world that when you actually even look at the law of that country, that request is like outside the bounds of the law. You know, it's happening here, it's happening, you know, the, if, you, if you go through this thing and you, you look at uh, their, their compliance with European government requests, it's about 50%. Um, so they're refusing another 50% because their lawyers have looked at it and said actually legally we don't have to comply with it, which is really interesting which means that because there's no transparency about what's going on, companies have a lot less incentive to challenge government demands, even when those demands are illegal, even in their own countries. Uh, and what we found actually from research that a number of groups have done on uh, rec law enforcement requests to cell phone companies and internet service providers in this country, none of which release, release data about the number of requests they're getting or the number of requests they're complying with. Uh, the result of that research has found that a non-trivial percentage of these requests um, are of dubious legality uh, and don't actually need, need, need to be complied with, but are being complied with anyway because that's just the easiest thing for the company to do. So that there's a growing what we call transparency movement 
around demanding that companies be transparent about this relationship with governments and law enforcement is a first step toward greater accountability both for governments and companies. And as you can see, I'm not talking about Saudi Arabia and China anymore, but my argument is if we don't get it right here, the rest of the world has a much lower chance of getting there or getting anywhere close. Um, just to mention a few more movements and then, and then I'll end, um, just a few things that are going on. There's starting to be an effort by a number of civil liberties groups and privacy groups around the world to set standards for, okay, we understand that some surveillance law needs to happen because there are bad guys that do bad things and surveillance happens, but, but how do you construct appropriate privacy and surveillance law that's compatible with civil, civil liberties and has adequate oversight. And so there's actually a movement of groups from a number of different countries to kind of say, here are the standards that, that law and government should adhere to, and here are the standards that companies should adhere to uh, as well. Um, there's an effort um, that's based in Stockholm, and they've called it the Stockholm Principles, to try and get governments to be more transparent about the demands they're making for user information on corporate networks. It's not getting too far, I, I have to admit, even with democratic governments, even with the governments who are touting internet freedom kind of on the, on the diplomatic uh, scale. There's something called the Global Network Initiative, which I'm on the board of, um, which is trying to get internet companies to um, sign on to core principles on free expression and privacy, and then actually agree to be audited on whether or not they're adhering to their commitments. Unfortunately, not too many companies have joined. Google, Yahoo, Microsoft, uh, and then another company called WebSense and, and a startup called Evica. Um, Facebook might join. We'll see. They have to decide soon. That would be useful. But no, you know, AT&T has not joined none of these guys. Uh, Verizon, Comcast, um, you know, they're not being held accountable. Uh, or they're not even agreeing to make the commitments which is troubling. You also have activist groups in a lot of countries now, particularly in Europe, just trying to get their own governments to enforce their own privacy laws. Um, there's, a, there's a problem in, in Europe where uh, Facebook is actually found to be in violation of a lot of privacy law, but the sort of Irish government, which is where Facebook is based in Europe, won't enforce its own law. So there's efforts to kind of lodge complaints and file lawsuits in that regard. Um, and also, just finally, um, my latest project, which is kind of tentatively called Ranking Digital Rights, is trying to develop a methodology to rank companies on their policies and practices in responding to government demands so that, okay, they won't sign up to a commitment, but we're going to score them anyway and give them a grade and sort of help the public understand what the differences are between different companies so that we can perhaps reward good behavior and also help to point out what governments are doing as well. And there's some other efforts to highlight um, and kind of shine light on the different practices that governments are undertaking in terms of surveillance or in terms of privacy protection, both good and bad. And so ultimately I'm coming back to, the, to this um, diagram that I used at the beginning. The future of democracy and human rights, civil liberties in the internet age, I believe, depends on whether we can hold the exercise of digital power accountable, which means that we need to be able to know what's going on in that cloud, who's exercising power over whom, and make sure that when abuse happens, it's constrained and held accountable. And this poses tremendous challenges for governance in a world that's globally interconnected and how do we make sure, how do you construct a system globally that's protecting the rights of people's, you know, the, the rights of people all over the world, the rights of internet users all over the world, not just in specific countries. Um, we have a long way to go. My book gets further into some of these questions as we try to work out sort of the geopolitics of the internet and also the human rights movement of the internet that's just emerging. Um, but uh, I thank you for your time and uh, I hope that you will all join me in being citizens of the internet just as we are 
citizens of our community. And just as we won't have rights in the physical world unless we fight for them and we work for them and that we make sure that our interests are represented and that our voices are heard, it's the same on the internet. Our, the internet will evolve based on who makes the biggest effort to shape it to their interest. And if it's only governments and companies working to shape it and citizens not engaging in the internet's future, then we can expect it won't turn out in the citizens' interests. So I hope you'll all join me and the many people uh, who are working around the world to hold power accountable and to inform each other of what's going on. And uh, I've got a Twitter account there and uh, a website and so on. And you're welcome to follow some of the links that I post online that might help you learn more about these issues. So thank you very much. Thanks, Rebecca. I've got to ask you kind of a bottom line <laughs> question at the end of this uh, uh, summary, which is, if you had to judge it, would you say that it's a corporate threat or a government threat that is most significant to citizens' freedom and rights on the internet? It's really a combination. Um, the, I think the greatest threat is when you have unaccountable government combined with unaccountable corporations together. That's where the greatest abuses happen. Um, ultimately, if you don't have a government that's committed to protecting the rights of the citizens, it's absolutely true. There's only so far that companies can go, and it becomes about how do they mitigate and how do they at least serve as neutrally as possible without amplifying and exacerbating and enabling the problem. But, you know, the companies aren't Human Rights Watch or, you know, so on. But at very least do no harm. Um, but companies, when they do not accept that they have responsibilities towards civil liberties, to, towards human rights, towards the future of an internet that's actually democracy compatible, that's highly problematic. So are you thinking that this is going to require an international political agreement or framework of some sort in addition to an international corporate agreement or framework? Mm -hmm. Or are you seeing this as individual corporations making individual decisions and individual governments making individual decisions? Yeah, I think it's kind of, I don't think we're going to see an international agreement. I think sort of top down, it's not how the internet works, and I don't think how the solutions are, are going to, to pan out. I think it's going to be around citizens engaging in dealing with specific problems, trying to engage with actors both on the corporate side and on the governmental side that are on their side, uh, and forming alliances. And just as with, you know, our, just as with democracy where it's, messy and you're pushing and pulling and you have coalitions of self-interested people who get together and if the system is kind of, if powers are balanced right, it sort of can turn out to check against abuse. Um, I, th I think it's, it's not going to be a new centralized system or a new centralized world government, but rather we're already starting to see a number of organizations emerging that are trying to negotiate problem solving and negotiate kind of information gaps in ways that will help to make those who wield power in certain realms more accountable. So it's messy. And you know, our conversations all day have sort of been full of, you know, there's no like ultimate easy answer to, to many of these things. Um, a final question for me and then we'll turn to our, uh, to our audience for questions. Uh, you mentioned Facebook, you mentioned a number of corporations, but for the sake of argument at the moment, let's just choose one of them, Facebook. Uh, Excuse me. If, if you were the CEO of Facebook, what would motivate you with the goals that you've just set out? What would motivate you as a private corporation that has made outstanding use of this internet technology mm -hmm. 
to do anything other than whatever you want to do on it. All right. Well, I'm definitely not Mark Zuckerberg. Um, <laughs> actually, in my book, I have a chapter where I talk about the Sultan of Facebookistan, the Sultan of the Kingdom of Facebookistan. And, and I guess, you know, to continue that analogy, why is it that, you know, ultimately, if you want legitimacy sort of with your users, if you want long-term trust of your brand, are you best off being a dictator? Or are you best off figuring out, OK, how do I build trust? How do I make sure that my business is actually sustainably integrated into the kind of values that are compatible with the kind of society that I want? I assume he wants democracy and freedom of speech, you know? Um, and that the bottom line may be the kind of short-term thing. But I think increasingly, um, with a lot of companies on a lot of issues, you're starting to see recognition that longer-term thinking actually helps the value of your brand and your business over the long term. So, you know, it was uh, not so long ago that it was normal for companies to, you know, abuse their workers and hire 12-year-olds and, and pollute the environment and... You know, the justification was, it's what we have to do to stay in business. All my competitors are doing it. You know, that has changed over time. It didn't change easily. It took a lot of activism. It took shareholder activism. It took consumer advocacy. It took policy advocacy. It took a huge movement. You know, you had the labor movement was a generation. The environmental movement, another generation. And now we've sort of got a nascent internet freedom movement for, I'm not sure if I like that term, but for lack of a better, better one um, that's recognizing and that's starting to work at the problem in different places. You've got some people working on policy and law at the national level, some people working on inter international policy frameworks. You've got some people working on corporate responsibility, consumer advocacy, shareholders are starting to get interested in these issues. And one of the reasons why I'm doing my rankings project is to give shareholders a tool to decide what they want to invest in or not based on if they, if they want to, you know, include among, you know, the socially responsible investors who, who actually include environmental factors or labor, labor factors and other factors, governance factors in their decisions about what stocks to choose, give them the option also free expression and privacy if you want to include that in your basket of choices. So, you know... There definitely need to be levers, but I think there's a history of companies recognizing on other issues that there's the short-term profit and there's the long-term value and the long-term also public trust in your brand. And so the hope is, again, I'm no Mark Zuckerberg, I can tell you that. Um, <laughs> uh, the hope is that he will see that he needs to make commitments um, he needs to engage um, if he's going to be concerned about people trusting his platform going forward. You know, it's kind of cool at the moment, popular, but whether it remains cool in the long run, it may depend on some of these choices he makes. Okay, let's turn to your questions. Let's start with a question from a non-student. question from a non-student. Yes, ma'am. The question is, That's have you ever question. been threatened in this country or abroad? I've not been threatened in this country, no. I mean, you know, not in any serious way. Are you asking big. about but, uh, about in connection with Internet? Uh, just in general. Yeah. Okay, yeah. all right. I, I've not been threatened in this country. Um, I, when I worked in China, I got detained. You know, I was working for CNN, and, you know, we'd try to cover protests or, or interview dissidents, and we would get detained from time to time. Um, it was never, the detentions were not physically threatening. They sometimes threatened to throw me out of the country, and one time it came close. Um, I did get attacked by an angry mob once, but, uh, you know, that was a uh, long story. Um, but, uh, yeah, um, I, so I guess the answer is I've sort of been threatened, but I haven't been threatened in ways that made me really scared. Uh, except when I got attacked by the angry mob. 
And, um, and let, me, let me frame it in the terms of this uh, topic tonight. Have you been threatened, and I don't yeah. mean in this case physically threatened sure. perhaps, but uh, have you been threatened by corporations or mm -hmm. governments who disagree with your point of view on this topic? I've not. Um, I mean, other than Chinese government threatening to throw me out of the country, uh, which is a kind of threat. Um, but um, I, I guess it also, I mean, for the past 10 years, I've been working pretty independently. And so if I was really concerned about losing my job, I might be making different choices. Um, or if, you know, if I had a different type of job um, and, you know, what you consider a threat and what your priorities are. And I just happen to be fairly unusual in, in that I'm, you know, I don't have anybody depending on me financially, so I can take a lot more risks than, you know, some people I know are, are willing to take in, in terms of just angering certain people. <laughs> um, but, but physically, I, I've been lucky. I mean, I, I know people who do get kind of just threatened by, you know, more by crazy people than anything else, and that's not happened. How about a question from a student? A question from a student. Yes, yeah. One of the things that I find very difficult about this is just how confusing it is. Even yeah. When I speak to other um, graduates of engineering. Yeah. We, we have discussions about is this piece of software more trustworthy than that piece of software? And, and, and even when you read all the explanations, it doesn't always make sense, and it's not clear, and, and, and I can't imagine that everybody is even doing that. Yeah. Um, so it feels like how can how can us as a society make it different if we can't understand it? Yeah, it's okay. really hard. So I mean, that's so the question. Hang on. Yeah, the oh, question right. is, um, it's all very confusing. It's technical. It's politically and socially and culturally confusing. And even engineers who try to understand mm -hmm. this stuff have a hard time with it. And yeah. so the bottom line question is, how can we as citizens, yeah. as you've urged us to, become involved in these issues? make a difference when we have a hard time understanding Yeah, no, I mean, these are really hard issues. And one of the things that the human rights community is doing and that we're doing with the Global Network Initiative, which unfortunately not many country companies have signed on to, um, is ask that companies when, in the course of developing a new product that's significantly new or going into a new market or a combination of both, should be conducting what we call human rights impact assessments, but you know, sort of have components of privacy impact assessments and other risk impact assessments. Um, and the point is to, to, because sort of in the abstract, it is hard to know, you know, is this software or is this piece of hardware, kind of what's it gonna do? But you try and run it through scenarios. So one, one of the, the things that some people are developing is a method where you say, okay, I take this software and I take this software. And let's take the hypothetical that's being used by a specific type of person in Syria or being used by a Chinese religious activist in a specific context or it's being used, you know, just you name the scenario to come up with really specific scenarios and then try and play it out. And it's hard, you know, and this is one of the things I found with, through the Global Network Initiative where we sat down with people in companies who, you know, say, well, it's hard to know, you're an engineer, you're sitting in Palo Alto, you know, how's this gonna play out? Who knows, you know? Uh, and sometimes people kind of guess the wrong way and, and unfortunate things happen. Um, and you can't, you can't totally anticipate everything, but you can sort of, if you consult with at sort of the most vulnerable populations who might end up using that technology. And you say, okay, what's your biggest risk scenario and what are the use cases for this technology that are potentially involving the greatest amount of risk? And let's game through what might happen. That, that can help. It, it doesn't prevent all problems, but if a company commits to doing that kind of thing, obviously if you're a startup with three people in a basement, it's hard, but what we're also finding is that the companies with more resources, if they share their learning and sort of best practices on this, it can be helpful. So in part, you know, let's get the, the kind of business community kind of helping each other out. Um, you know, early stage investors could also help startups with some kind of guidelines for, 
for ways to approach this. But it is hard, and, and it's also the reason why, for instance, with this initiative I'm involved with, which I wish more companies would join, companies do screw up. And so part of it is rec owning your screw up, <laughs> owning the mistake, and doing everything you can to mitigate and address the damage um, and, and to assist the people who've been hurt. Um, and that's a very important part of it too. And we're starting to see some companies actually doing that here and there, um, but it kind of goes against their instinct for all kinds of reasons. Rebecca, I can't help feeling that a lot of what you're talking about is American. And I want to ask you whether the solutions to the problems you're, you're discussing mm -hmm. are going to turn out to be driven by American corporations, American government initiatives, American citizen initiatives, or whether you think um, we've, even though we've developed most of the initial technologies and so on, whether the political impact that you're seeking in mm -hmm. the future is really going to come from outside the United yeah, States. Yeah, I, I think the solutions won't work unless there's widespread global involvement in them. Um, you know, I think there's some governments that are not going to engage on these issues in a human rights-centric way anytime soon, but there are a lot of citizen groups that will. And so, for instance, I work very closely with people in India, you know, um, it's I mean, I, I work with some folks in China, but of course it's quite dangerous for them to work on these issues. Um, so it's, it's very kind of below board, but there are groups in India, kind of throughout Africa, uh, throughout the Middle East increasingly. There's some really active Tunisian groups, for instance, uh, and some, some groups in other parts of, of North Africa and the Middle East um, that are quite engaged on these issues and quite engaged with both companies and governments um, about what they feel is necessary if their rights are going to be protected from, again, from a citizen, civil society kind of citizen-centric point of view. If it just comes from Americans, it's going to be much easier for a lot of companies that aren't American and a lot of governments, like the Chinese government, already do this, say, this is just another cover from imper for imperialism. This is just another cover for American merc mercantilism, trying to get everybody to use Google. You know, this isn't about human rights at all. And the only way for this type of, of effort to have genuine global legitimacy and to be able to counteract kind of the anti-imperialist arguments that get made by largely by authoritarian governments, but also by some others, is that you have people um, around the developing world um, engaged in talking about what they want. And as it so happens, there are large communities where people are free enough to speak and organize on these issues, and they're starting to get more organized. Okay, question from a non-student. Yes, go ahead. A uh, question about, about uh, I find it ironic that Google is involved in some of these things about privacy and use of Facebook to a certain extent. And I'm look, asking about the concern where privacy is, you know, is being, is being uh, compromised. And Google, from its personalization approach, mm -hmm. uses 57 signals. And yeah. it follows everything it, every, uh, you do, when you click, how you click, and so on. Uh, and that. Uh, uh, for Eric Schmidt or Sergey to argue about the concern for privacy seems, seems, seems disingenuous. Yeah. But where do you think, where, do you, where might the threat be more serious then from, from <coughs> search engines like Google and Facebook, mm -hmm. let alone other or the corporate entities or governments? Yeah. Well, right, so the question, yeah. the, just, oh, sorry, uh, I keep I'm sorry, forgetting. I just have to paraphrase <laughs> for those who are listening online. Uh, I, I hope you understand. Uh, I'll just briefly say, uh, you're, I think you're basically mm -hmm. asking whether the threat to these freedoms on the internet is more significant from corporations limiting individuals' behavior mm -hmm. or from governments limiting individuals' behavior. Yeah. yeah, well, I mean, you know, this, this is a concern, just the extent to which Google collects information and tracks it. And they counter that, well, you know, we have this dashboard and you can see what we're collecting. If you go and look, um, that's one response they have. Um, you know, I count, I would really like to have an option where I can encrypt my Gmail so that they can't scan it for its content and run ads against it because 
that's problematic to me for a number of reasons. Yet at the same time, one really interesting thing is that activists in authoritarian countries around the world actually use Gmail very heavily because even though Google can see everything they're doing, it has a higher level of security against government intrusion, both in terms of government attacks and also surveillance, network surveillance. And of course, that's a greater threat from the perspective of an activist in China or a, you know, an activist in Bahrain, say. Uh, and so part of it has to do with kind of where you are and, you know, as the pros say in the business, what your threat model is. Um, but on the other hand, it's problematic that Google is sort of keeping all this stuff and collecting it. Uh, and while maybe the Chinese government can't get at it, um, the NSA can get at it and, you know, your email stored after 180 days can just be requested. Um, and, you know, even people like the former director of the CIA got caught out because of that, uh, which is pretty funny. Um, or not, um, but uh, You're talking about David Petraeus. yes, um, and his affair. Um, but uh, you know, um, but the fact that all of that is being stored and potentially accessible um, by a requesting government, and then it's sort of how is their Google's response is that well, we're being very careful about where we're storing that, and we're storing it in jurisdictions where we can kind of push back and we're being transparent about what we're doing because we're issuing this transparency report, which is better than not, right? So at least you have some idea of what they're doing and you know that they are actually challenging a lot of requests that are not, you know, that are stretching the law, but nonetheless they are still complying with the law and I'd rather be able to just mask all my email within Gmail or be able to have a trade-off, say, like, I'll pay them a little bit more to have a more secure service that doesn't store my stuff um, or something like that. So I, I, wish, I wish they would give us more choices. Um, uh, but I guess given what they're doing, I'm at least glad that they're trying to be transparent and they're trying to push back. Um, that doesn't, of course, again, it doesn't, it, it doesn't go all the way for me but it's better than you know, collecting everything and then being really opaque about what they're doing. Um, so they've kind of gone halfway. Um, I wish they'd go farther. Devil's advocate question though, if, if, if you were Google, mm -hmm. wouldn't you answer, well, just use another email client if you don't like ours. You know, they're, they're easy to find, mm -hmm. they're easy to create yourself. You know, you don't have to use our product. Um, that, could be a corporate oh, response. Oh, sure. Well, that's you're... often the response. Actually, you know, Google Two's credit, its credit, I have not heard them say that for a number of years. Well, they don't They've want sort to of yeah. graduated from that response. Um, there are some other companies, I've heard that response from Facebook fairly recently and, and from some other companies. Um, the, you know, and the my response is. The cable is, TV companies are. Yeah. Famous for that. Well, they're, say, you don't yeah. like us, go someplace yeah. else. Yeah, and no like how many markets is like Comcast the right. only player in town? Right. Yeah, I mean, you know, if you, if you don't have adequate competition, it's a problem. Why, you know, I use Gmail. Why do I use Gmail? Because it's more secure than the alternatives, even though they're running ads, you know, they're tracking my stuff and running ads against it. Um, you know, the number of people I know who have Hotmail and Yahoo accounts who every once in a while I get an email from them saying I'm stuck in Spain and I lost my wallet and you can, can you please wire $800 to me? You know, I, I get these things all the time from people using everything pretty much but Gmail um, because those, those services are much more hackable, you know, and, and this is part of the problem is that, you know, one of the responses to this kind of concentrated corporate power is to say, okay, let's just create a lot of, you know, do it ourselves, run our own email server from our house, you know, do non-commercial stuff. One of the problems that people have been finding with that approach is that the security problems are so hard, especially if you're doing anything politically sensitive or if you have any enemies, you're gonna get hacked. And, and to have the technical ability to protect your data, unless you've got sort of Google-grade engineers working for you is getting increasingly hard. So it's, you know, 
which is why I end up coming back to, you know, we have to just keep pushing these companies, you know, further as far as we can. Um, at the same time, however, to come back to your first question, if we have bad law, if we have a government that's not being held accountable, if we have lawmaking processes that are corrupt, um, you know, ultimately, if, if you've got a legal and political system that is not sufficiently respectful of human rights and civil liberties, it, there's only f so far companies can go. Nonetheless, within that, companies have a responsibility to do whatever they can. Before we say thanks to Rebecca McKinnon tonight, let me, uh, allow me a couple of announcements, please. Rebecca's book is available for sale in the lobby tonight, and she's agreed to stick around for a few minutes if you'd like a signed copy. She's got to catch a train, so we've got a hard deadline on that, and uh, I'm going to wrap up a little bit early. So if you do want an autographed book, please make your way immediately to the book table outside in the lobby. I'd also like to note that when Global Agenda returns to the University of Delaware next year in February, it'll be in the very capable hands of my friend and colleague here at UD, Dr. Julio Carrion, director of the Center for Global and Area Studies. The Center for Political Communication will continue to co-sponsor the series under Julio's adequate, uh, very excellent leadership. To be sure you don't miss announcements of those programs coming up next year and other programs, Please get yourself on the list. There are bright orange sheets out in the lobby this evening. Put your email and your name on there. Print clearly your email address so we can read it. And now, please let's thank our speaker tonight, Rebecca McKinnon, for coming to the University of Delaware. Thank you very much. Thank you.